Good evening, everybody. Thank you for taking time out of your evening to join us tonight. Um, this will be our fourth community meeting, and we are going to be covering House Bill 676 and Senate Bill 518. Uh, we're going to reverse the order on our agenda um, as we do have Senator Manzella and Representative Carrie Seekins Crow joining us tonight. So they'll be able to introduce their bill a little bit and, and chime in on um, some of the legislative aspects of these bills. Um, and so I want to introduce our chief legal counsel, Rob Stutz. He will be going through the bill tonight. If you have any questions, please just um, raise your hand or, or make a comment in the chat. And uh, when we get a chance to pause and break, we will take questions. So without uh, any further ado, Rob Stutz. Thank you, Jenna. And good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us on another one of our community discussions about legislation from the 2023 session. Uh, my name is Rob Stutz. I'm the Chief Legal Counsel here at the Office of Public Instruction. I've also um, taken on the role of being the deputy superintendent. So um, I'm glad to see so many people joining us uh, tonight, including Senator Manzella. Um, before we begin um, getting into the details of the bill, I do wanna share my screen for those who are new to, um, to the process so that you can see um, what OPI is doing and um, how we're doing it. So here on the OPI website, we do have a link for uh, parent resources. When you click on that link, you get information about events that we're sponsoring, including these community discussion nights. Um, tonight is uh, September 20th. We're gonna be talking about those two bills, both of which address parental rights. And um, in the future, you can keep track of this to see upcoming um, events that we have scheduled. You can also receive the information about the previous events that we've done. Um, the way that we do this is we look to the language of the bill and we have a conversation. Um, we usually get some involvement with folks online ab about the bill, about what the bill means. And um, um, we're privileged today to have the uh, uh, Senator here with us to provide some context for the bill about how it was being developed. For those of you new to legislation, you can go to the Montana Legislature homepage, that's ledge.mt.gov. You can look up the bill information, and in this case, the first bill we're going to be looking at is Senate Bill 518. As and we dive in, it, it, uh, excuse me, Rob, I just wanted to um, start off, if when as we dive into this bill, um, I would like to just take a moment and let Senator Manzella yeah, introduce this bill from from her standpoint as the as the sponsor of the bill. Um, so if we could just give her a moment to chime in, that would be great. Perfect. Now that we're now that we're at the bill, folks can look it up themselves. Senator Manzella. Thank you. Thank you, Jenna. Thank you, Rob. Appreciate the opportunity to be with you all tonight. Who is in our audience? May I ask who who our audience is made up of? Um, we put it out to the public. So, okay. uh, you know, we have roughly 40 folks out here um, and okay. yep, it's just a mixed audience of okay. whoever okay. wanted to chime in. All right. Well, good. Thank you so much. Thanks everybody for participating tonight. We're taking a break from our constitutional study uh, to share with you tonight. And Senate Bill 518 is, uh, is a continuation of the work that I started at the prior legislative session where Senate Bill, Bill 400 was passed, uh, which we affectionately called our Parents' Bill of Rights that created a cause of action for parents if they felt that their uh, parental rights had been violated. So just simply starting with the title, uh, so much of the bill, the uh, content of the bill is provided in the title, an act generally revising laws invol involving parental rights, providing for a parent involvement in education, providing that the parents may withdraw their child from certain school instructions, including for religious purposes, requiring school districts to provide information to parents about the educational opportunities available to children of the district, 
establishing additional parental rights and responsibilities, providing that with certain exceptions, employees of governmental entities are prohibited from withholding certain information from parents, increasing the filing fee. So um, starting off with section one, section one, uh, parental involvement in education, the board of trustees of a school district in consultation with parents, teachers, and administrators shall develop and adopt a policy to promote involvement of parents of children enrolled in the school district. And that includes a plan for parents to participate with the school district and uh, de uh, designed to improve parent and teacher cooperation and homework attendance and, and discipline. A plan to provide parents with information about how to participate participate in the governance of school districts through local elected board of trustees. Then we go on to procedures by which parents may learn about the course of study for a, a parent's child. Uh, procedures by which a parent may withdraw the parent's child from instruction or presentations, assemblies, guest lectures, or any other educational events facilitated by the school's faculty or staff including those conducted by outside individuals or organizations that offend the parents' beliefs or practices. And uh, that correlates with a little bit further back, you'll see uh, compulsory attendance, that's section four. Uh, those, uh, those, if a parent removes their child for the, any of those purposes, then those uh, absences are considered excused. Um, let's see. So that would be an opt out. The parent, the parent would withdraw the child from instruction for things that they deem offenses, offensive. Um, let's see. And may withdraw parent's child from any club or extracurricular activity. In our area here in the Bitterroot Valley, we did have some secret, uh, clubs, that the parents had no idea about, and the effort was to address that. Uh, nothing should be hidden from parents concerning their children. Uh, let's see, so I'm on now page two. Opt in on F, procedures by which a parent shall provide written consent before the parent's child uses a pronoun that does not align with the child's sex. If a parent provides written consent under subsection one, a person may not be compelled to use pronouns that do not align with the child's sex. So that is designed to protect parents from a situation where their child goes to school and becomes a different person using different pronouns. And the person that's listed here is specifically designed to protect a teacher's right of conscience. And that issue has been adjudicated from one end of the country to the other through the courts. And um, the bill is aligned with their decisions. Uh, sub two there, you can see that the school, the board of trustees may arrange for uh, electronic form of communication. Um, section two, the construction. Unless parental rights have been legally waived or legally terminated, parents have inalienable rights that are more comprehensive than those described in 40-6-701. And again, 40-6-701 was from uh, the session prior to this, just this past session, the 21 session, where we created the cause of action and strict scrutiny is to be applied under those circumstances. So, uh, Parental, parental rights are inalienable rights, and they are to be recognized and treated as such. Um, dropping down to sub four, if a child has no affirmative right of access to a particular medical or mental health procedure, uh, then nothing in 40-6-701 or section one may be construed to grant a child's parent an affirmative right to access to the procedure or service on the child's behalf. So that was designed to work in harmony and reconcile comfortably with Senate Bill 99, which was our Youth Protection Act, preventing 
minors from transitioning and preventing actually parents from from giving their minor children the right to transition. So that is what is considered a compelling state's interest. Um, section three, information on educational opportunity, duties of the trustees. Uh, the board of trustees shall develop, update, and annually provide to students and families of the district information on educational op opportunities. And on the next page, there's uh, a long, a long list of those. Um, and then uh, sub three is quite important. The legislature intends that boards of trustees and organization of boards of trustees communicate and collaborate with the education interim committee to demonstrate the implementation of the requirements of this section to identify additional opportunities following legislative sessions. So we certainly hope you know the the desire and and the goal is for all parties involved to be, communicating and working together, uh, hopefully in harmony for the good of the ch child's education, parents, uh, teachers, boards of trustees, um, all parties involved. Um, and then there again, you see the compulsory attendance. And um, uh, if you drop down to sub E, that's where the absence is excused. If the a uh, parent chooses to withdraw a child from a lecture or a class for things that they find inoffensive. Um, and basically, I think that's, I mean, that pretty, pretty much is it. I maybe, I don't know if uh, I probably just duplicated what, a lot of what Rob was going to say, but he might be willing to go into more depth and, um, uh, Thank you for your time and attention and uh, appreciate your, I really appreciate that OPI is doing this in an, in an effort to try to get everybody uh, understanding and on the same page. So thank you, Jenna and Rob, for doing that. Absolutely. Thank you for taking time out of your study tonight to join us. And I think it's wonderful that we can have legislators give, share a little bit more. You know, we can't always um, do a deep dive into intent of bill, but we try to cover um, at, at the surface level, what the intent of these bills are. So it's very valuable having having you here with us. So thank you for your time. Um, and I know you need to jump off. Is there any? Are there any questions um, for for Senator Manzella? I don't see any hands up out here. I'm doing a quick scan before we let you go. Yep, I think we're good. Thank you, Senator. Have a great evening. And I'm going to turn this over to Rob to finish up on your bill. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Have a good evening. Um, so, Senator Manzella, there was one question that appeared in the chat um, just before uh, just before you wrapped up. Um, and it says, are there any school boards that have been resistant to these policies? It's a question from Corin Ross. And um, I don't know if the Senator is still here or if she can uh, speak to that issue. I, I am still here. I was just about to uh, exit and I heard you speak my name. So uh, the score, school board associations um, came in in support of the bill and they were actually um, quite quite supportive. So, so I was very pleased with that. And as far as specific school boards, I've only had positive comments. I'm sure there are some out there that I am, have not been in touch with, but um, but the school board association as a whole and the, what did they call it? Um, Jenna, maybe you can help me. There's a, there's a, uh, several coordinated organizations that came in and supported the bill. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, actually, Senator Manzella, we have one more question if you don't mind. <laughs> okay. Okay. Sorry. We'll try to, we'll try to end it after this one for you. Um, so I, I see Don, uh, Monroe, yes. your hand is up. Well, I, I just have a question about the workload of teachers. And so if we have 10 parents that really want to individualize 
instruction for their children with things that they find offensive. Are, are there any provisions at the state to um, reduce the size of classes so teachers have more time to address these individual requests? Or are we expecting teachers with classes of 30 kids now um, to be able to accommodate this? And how much time are you believing it will take additionally for teachers to meet the needs of parents for an average class? And you're addressing that question to me? Yes. Uh, the bill addresses the opportunity for parents to withdraw their children from any uh, lecture or uh, or program that they find offensive. So that should not create any additional work for you. Okay, and and then there's um, so if well. If that happens, then am I supposed to get back to the parent if I'm a teacher and say, we have, what is that child supposed to do in the interim? Am I, in, as the teacher, supposed to find another assignment for them? The, no, it's being addressed by the uh, parent can withdraw their child from any program or instruction that they do not feel appropriate and therefore, uh, and that is an excused absence. So however you handle excused absences would be your responsibility. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Senator I'll Manzella, thank you so much for your time this evening. We know you have to run. You bet. Thank you, Jenna. Thank you, Rob. Thank Appreciate you. it. Good night. Thank you. If there are any follow-up questions for the Senator directly, um, her email is out on the Montana Legislature website. So you can feel free to email those questions to her. We're gonna continue on and, um, and perhaps if Rob can answer any of your questions, feel free to direct those at him. Rob, do you wanna pick it up from there? Uh, sure thing, and I saw a hand up. I don't know if that question was directed at me or at the Senator. Uh, Bailey, do you want to unmute? And I think, think you have a question. Bailey, do you have a question? I, I see your hand is up. I can't hear her, so maybe she can put it in the chat. Okay, I'll just I'll just um, move forward. I'm sorry, can you hear me now? Can you hear oh, me now? there you are. Yeah, yeah, we can hear hey, you. Sorry about that. Okay, no so being a transgender, so being a transgender person in the state of Montana myself, so I have um, reserves regarding outing uh, transgender students um, because their parents are unsupportive of them. Um, has anybody taken into consideration what this is going to deal with with like their mental health as a student in in grade school? Okay, I'll tackle that question as best as I can. Um, so what the legislation is directed at is it's directed at the policies of a local school district. If we look uh, right here, the board of trustees of a school district in consultation shall develop and adopt a policy. And that policy, that list um, allows for each uh, school district to personalize how they address those types of questions. It also allows, I should mention here, down in section three of the bill, um, that um, even if they don't personalize a policy to address those issues, the school board may satisfy its obligation by using a model resource or policy developed by an organization of school boards of which the school board is a member. And so really uh, your, your question, I think it's down to uh, local, a local issue for school districts about how each school district is going to address um, the implementation of those policy requirements. So I, I don't have an answer for you. Uh, that answer could vary from district to district, um, but uh, it is it is a question that will be addressed at the local level or perhaps at those statewide school board organizations. 
Okay, yeah, because the only reason why I bring it up, you know, because, um, you know, transgender suicide rate is going to be on the rise. And that's just one of those things that you guys are going to, you know, be watching out for if you guys do pass, continue passing these um, hateful, hateful laws. We appreciate the comment. And I, um, I'll just, I'll just mention, I don't, I didn't watch these bills as they were being considered by the legislature. I don't know um, what type of uh, comment occurred during the legislative committee hearings, but, um, you know, certainly um, the Office of Public Instruction um, doesn't draft the bills um, and doesn't adopt the bills. That's a, a legislative function. And so um, I think that in this case, it was interesting to have the sponsor of the bill um, provide a perspective about what their considerations are. But at the end of the day, um, the statutes, the bills are, um, you know, considered by the legislature based on all that input they got during the, um, the various committee hearings. Jenna, you're muted. Apologize. There are a few more questions in the chat box that um, I will pick up from here uh, and read to you. What if the curriculum is required by federal or state standards, the teacher would still need to provide accommodation? Uh, that's a question from Stephanie. Can you speak to that, mm -hmm. Rob? Well, and again, um, I guess I would defer to the judgment of either the local school board or the, the state school boards association that is developing a model policy to navigate um, both whatever the local interests are and the state and federal requirements. And, uh, the next question, if my child has been taught to respect classmates' desire to be called by their preferred name and gender, is my child at risk of punishment? Um, so I think that... Um, if you look at the bill, and we've got it right here, it says, um, if a parent can, uh, provides written consent under this subsection, a person may not be compelled to use pronoun pronouns that do not align with the child's sex. And if you look at the introductory section for that, and Again, this is all in the context of this is re a requirement for the school district to develop a policy. And so to be clear, the legislation doesn't require a particular outcome. The legislation requires a, a policy that addresses these questions. And so uh, again, a lot of those questions will come back to um, the local level, but nonetheless, um, so this refers to the written consent before the parent's child uses a pronoun. And it doesn't address specifically um, what happens if somebody else uses a pronoun, except to say that if a parent consents, another person is not compelled to use a, 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 a pronoun a particular pronoun, but it doesn't speak to a prohibition against using a particular pronoun. I don't know if that well, answers the question, but that's the, that's the the most specific answer I think that um, I can provide, um, given the requirement that the school board adopt a policy that addresses addresses these issues. And Jen, I I didn't say this at the outset because I know that we wanted. Uh, Senator Manzella to have that opportunity to introduce uh, her bill. But one of the things that we need to keep in mind that there are some significant legal questions that um, come up from time to time about how to implement these bills. And the Office of Public Instruction does not provide legal advice um, to individuals or to school districts about that. Um, and there are a variety of reasons for that, but um, we're hoping that, you know, I appreciate that we're having this conversation to so that people can ask their questions, raise their concerns, and we can we can discuss them. Um, but certainly your attorney's mileage may vary on how these statutes should be interpreted and applied. 
Uh, next question. Um, can a parent, uh, sorry, there's some typos in here, excuse a child and keep them home? Sorry, there's a lot of questions popping up, so it's scrolling up my my question, my chat box. Um, can a parent excuse a child to keep them home to care for younger children? I, um, this yeah, question yeah. is from Jeannie, so I'm not, yeah. Okay, um, so uh, that's an interesting question in part because it starts to touch on some of the issues we'll be discussing with regard to House Bill 676, but I think that it's um, for purposes of this bill, it's sufficient to point out that um, the compulsory attendance requirement um, doesn't apply when a child is excused pursuant to um, 40-6-701. That's uh, That statute is one that we're gonna be talking about more specifically when we get to House Bill 676. So um, there is the ability to excuse a child under that statute, and um, that statute was amended by the um, the other piece of litigation we'll be discuss discussing. And, and before we get to too many questions, Jenna, I just want to point out some commonalities as we um, look at these two bills. One thing that they have in common besides addressing um, the, the rights of parents is they have section two, and that's important, in particular for lawyers, because that discusses how the uh, legislature intends for the bill to be construed. We call it construction, statutory construction. And so, um, you know, this has very uh, broad language. Uh, it must be construed in favor of broad protection of the fundamental rights of parents. And it, uh, nothing, may be construed to authorize a governmental entity to burden the fundamental rights of pa parents. And so um, not only do we have the language of the bill, but we also have the legislators preferred interpretation of the language of the bill. Um, and I wanted to point that out in part because uh, a similar uh, construction clause also is in um, House Bill 676 that will be discussing momentarily. And we're going to need to transition to that bill in, in just a few minutes. I'm going to read one more question. And I know there's um, there's a hand up. So um, if we have time, we'll get we'll get to you right after this question. Um, and then we're going to have to move on to the next bill. But we'll be glad to, um, you know, if you want to email us and have any continued questions answered the best we can. And um, Jenna, we may also have time at the end of the discussion of the next bill to address other questions. So there's that possibility as well. Sure, yeah, we'll, we'll keep track. I know Denali um, has had um, a hand up for a little bit here. So I'm gonna read this one last question before we um, we move on to answer or to uh, unmute there. Is there a limit to the amount of instruction parents can opt their child out of? Would this not set up a scenario of students being excused from most all of a class if the parents are dissatisfied with their their grade or teacher? Yeah, so again, when we're looking at this bill, it's section four, it's the uh, amending the compulsory attendant, attendance statute. Um, it doesn't specifically identify any limit on the um, excused attendance from the instruction. And, and Jenna, with, with that, and I know we're bumping up um, um, against the time that we've allocated for the next bill, but I just want to point out there is uh, there is what's called a coordination instruction. It means that this bill uh, is changed depending on whether other bills, in this case, House Bill 352 passes or if House Bill 396 passes. And I'll just note for folks who are listening in that both of those bills, 352 and 396 passed. And so this coordinating language is also a part of the bill. I, I know we haven't discussed it yet, but um, but that's one of the techniques they use to make sure that uh, related bills have um, language that, that coordinates them. Our last question on this bill, uh, Denali, if you can unmute, um, Rob can. Uh, 
can you guys one more question yeah okay cool so much um yeah i guess i just wanted a little bit of clarification from rob because my understanding from some of your earlier explanations rob was that this kind of creates an individualized format for school boards to tailor policies um especially in regards to the discussion we were having about pronouns but from my understanding of the bill you know it doesn't say that the board of trustees in consultation with parents teachers administrators should adopt a policy surrounding preferred pronouns it says it should adopt a policy by which parents shall provide written consent before the parent's child uses a pronoun that does not align with their child's sex so to me that doesn't seem like kind of giving flexibility to school boards um to craft that policy it actually seems like it's um delineating a policy that must be adopted by school boards granted the language could be different so i guess i was just kind of looking for clarification because i really didn't see that kind of flexibility that you were describing if if that question makes sense yeah no i understand the question and um certainly there are limits to the policy that can be adopted under the um under the legislation but that policy ultimately would be adopted by the school boards of trustees trustees have uh meetings that are subject to the open meeting requirements and the public input requirements and um you know what that procedure looks like uh, for example, for subsection 1F can, can vary from district to district, whether it will or not, um, I can't I can't say, but there's also, like I said, that opportunity for um, a model policy or a model resource to be developed that a school a school board could adopt. So um, you're, you're right that policies are subject to whatever the requirements of the statute are. But within those requirements, there that's the flexibility I was talking about. They, so, but they, sorry, but, just the, but they can't they can't violate the statute. Right. So so there can be flexibility so long as that parental consent is required for preferred pronoun use. And the, the flexibility is just in the language, is essentially what you're saying. Yeah, I, I, I'm saying that the uh, particular policy isn't required but there are particular requirements that have to be addressed by the policy. Okay, thank you. So that I think, uh, Rob, is there any wrap up for um, Senate Bill 518 that you'd like to close with and we'll move on to House Bill 676 with Representative Seekins Crow? Um, I don't have any uh, other wrap up, but while you're doing introductions and when we hear from, um, um, Senator Seekins Crow. Uh, in the meantime, I will open up that bell. So thank you, Representative, for joining us this evening. Would you like to do a brief open on your bill and share with us um, just a little, you know, 50,000 foot overview of the bill? Certainly. Thank you so much. I really appreciate this time and the opportunity uh, to have a discussion on this bill. Uh, basically, um, this bill is in um, section one, uh, part two, where it says all fundamental parental rights are exclusively reserved to the parent of the child without obstruction or interference by the government entity, including but not limited to the rights and responsibilities to do the following. And that would be direct the education of the child, access any of the records that are there, direct in the upbringing of the child, direct moral or religious training of the child, making consent to all physical and mental health care decisions for the child, um, access and review all health and medical records of the child, consent before biometric scan, consent before records of the child's blood or DNA, consent before government entity makes an audio or video recording of the child. Um, and that's what I believe was really important is that parents are capable and able to direct their upbringing. And that's, those are the words that were most important to me in this bill is direct the upbringing, education, healthcare, and mental health of their children without the encumbrance of government entities. Thank you, Representative. Rob, would you like to start in with the bill? Uh, thank you, Jenna. Thank you, Representative. So um, this bill, uh, we were just talking in the other bill about its reference to 40-6-701. And here we see that statute. One thing that I'll, I'll note is that it's not a new statute. It's a statute that was uh, previously adopted. 
And what the representative's bill did is it it uh, it added to it, made some changes to it, but the interference with fundamental parental rights uh, statute is 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 not a new statute. Um, that being said, as the representative pointed out, there's um, quite a bit more uh, detail that's provided in the description of those uh, fundamental rights. And, um, you know, if I may, uh, Representative, mm -hmm. uh, uh, just ask, uh, what was the uh, impetus for more specifically identifying those fundamental rights uh, in, in your bill? Um, I had parents who were very concerned in coming to me and stating that there were decisions being made for their children without their consent, without their knowledge, and that they were very concerned that uh, this was happening um, in, in a variety of different modes, not, not just within our schools, but other entities that were making those decisions. And parents did want to be involved. They do want to know what's going on with their, their children. They want to know how they can be a part of their children's lives and not be opted out of their children's lives by these governor government entities. And that was what was happening is they were being opted out. And um, with that in mind, I know that there's a discussion. Um, um, there's There's been uh, questions, perhaps some that came up during the legislative committee uh, hearings about emergency situations. Um, if you could address how emergency situations were uh, considered and um, discussed by the um, by the committee and by by you in the bill. I know that um, farther down, and we can get to some of those specific provisions. Yeah, thank you so much. And um, I'm looking through it myself as we're talking about it. That that if a child is emancipated, they they have control. So that is still there. If they're under the control in foster care, those foster parents have the ability to direct that, um, that also if that health professionals may guide in the medical care if a parent is not around and not able to give consent at that appointment, at that part, we know that that happens. Um, or if there's severe complications that happen or major surgery or prolonged, uh, you'll see that in section five of this bill. Um, and so there, there was, there were discussions because and there's emergencies and special situations, you know, for instance, uh, my kids played in sports, so if they were uh, playing football and something happened, then there, there could be um, medical attention given at that point and at that time. But parents should al always be the, the first option. Parents should always be um, the ones who are notified first. And so in it, we're just at a very interesting stage now where um, parents have been kept out. And that was the purpose of this. It wasn't to to keep people who care about our kids from caring about our kids. Um, but it was about um, making sure that we keep parents in the in the um, in the loop as well. And, um, you know, I've got kids in school as well, and I uh, can appreciate that um, example you used as far as the medical care for children in the emergency situations. I will note that um, the prohibitions under the medical care for children section don't apply if, uh, do not apply if the parent or child, if the parent of the child has provided yep. consent for medical care. So there's that opportunity in, I suppose, sporting activities or <laughs> other school events. Um, if there's a concern um, that parents would have the ability to address it by uh, providing ad advanced consent in those situations. And also you can see right underneath that, and, and if the parents' decision-making rights have been limited by court order um, as well, then they're they're limited as well, which is something that, that seems to make sense and that we're expecting. But what we haven't been expecting is that parents have been kept out of the loop um, without all of these provisions. And parents want to know what's going on with their children. Okay. Um, and in addition to that parental consent, um, there's also the provision in um, situations when a physician, for example, determines based on, uh, on the situation that they need to take medical, provide medical services, medical care, to prevent uh, death or imminent irreparable 
physical injury? Well, exactly. I mean, my, for instance, my son is um, uh, deathly allergic to bee stings and he carries an EpiPen. And, and so I think it, it was highly appropriate if, if he were stung by a bee that that would, that treatment would be given to him. And, and I think that this is really just about, you know, ensuring that parents still maintain a voice in their children's health care. And um, I had just had, had talked to numerous parents who uh, believed that their voices were being tampered. One thing that I'll point out since we're in this part of the bill is that there is this construction um, clause like there was in um, Senator Manzella's bill that provides uh, the legislative uh, explanation that the legislation should be broadly construed in um, favor of broad protection of the fundamental rights of parents. And I believe, although I haven't done a word by word comparison, I believe that the language is um, is almost identical or identical to the language in um, Senator Manzella's bill. Was, was that uh, something that you guys had coordinated on? Uh, yeah, there was multiple discussions. There are a few questions popping up in the chat box. Rob, can I go ahead and take a couple of those? Um, yeah, let me just let me just jump to a couple of other things that I wanted to highlight in the bill before we get to the questions, just in case the, there are questions about um, these provisions or just in case um, you know that discussion sparks some additional questions. Uh, one thing that I'll, I'll note um, is that there are certain circumstances that have been in Montana law and that remain in Montana law um, regarding the um, minor giving consent to certain types of, or to procedures in certain situations. Um, it, it does look like there was some um, cleanup in the language, but um, one change that I'll note is the release of information by a health professional regarding um, information about emancipated minor. That language uh, clarified that uh, instead of the information uh, being able to be released to the parents, it requires that it be able to be released. And so that, that changed the discretion on there. Um, there was more uh, language. And again, this language coordinates with some of the stuff we've seen um, earlier, but about medical care in uh, emergency situations. So there are, that's addressed in a, in a couple of different statutes. Um, and then I'll note that unlike the other bill, um, this bill also repealed um, the 41-4-406 regarding um, uh, certain psychiatric or psychological care. Um, and I didn't know if that was um, something you wanted to speak to, uh, Representative? Um, no. I Not to put you on the spot. Yeah, no, because that was, um, my brain is trying to think back that, um, I, I am so sorry, but right now, I mean, we did deal with that um, because that is dealt with. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I, I'm. I don't need to deal with that at this time. Okay. Okay. And it, and it may be that um, those situations were are already addressed under the the language um, for emergency situations. In any event, I, um, but uh, I guess uh, we'll go back to the beginning of the bill. And um, yeah, Jenna, I've. Um, we've had an overview of the changes and some of the context from um, Representative Seekins Crow, and um, and if there are any questions, we'll do our best to try to address them. Yeah, let's we'll start off with um, Emily uh, had a question. What constitutes an urgent circumstance in ur urgent circumstance in regards to psychological counseling? With, um, I'm, Rob, I don't know if you have a definition for that, that would be a legal um, urgent circumstance, but I think that um, being a parent who 
dealt with a child who was dealing with um, psychological counseling and there were some urgent circumstances that happened because of that, that um, I was very thankful at the time that the school always kept me informed and I was a part of everything that was going on. Um, so, uh, but yeah. go ahead. I was going to say one, one thing I'll note is that that use of the term urgent circumstances is in the statute that was repealed by this bill. And so um, typically um, we would be looking at the emergency um, circum circumstances and those uh, are not uh, those emergency situations are not something that was um, addressed by this bill or frankly even changed by this bill. These statutes, um, 414403, 411405, um, 411402, those, those, those are the same. Those are the same. So whichever definitions um, uh, have applied in the past in those situations and um, would still apply in this bill, the, the, the definitions weren't affected by this bill. Next question, in a non-emergency, and this is kind of a comment question, it looks like. Um, this is from Kevin. In a non-emergency situation, would parents need to give consent to allow their child to visit the nurse? This seems like a burden for parents, students, teachers, et cetera. Um, so, yeah, if you look at the bill um, and the, the language that was adopted, it... Uh, it requires the parental consent um, to all physical and mental health care decisions for the child. So that would uh, include those non-emergency situations. I think that that's the intent of the bill is to um, require the parental involvement in, in all of those non-emergency situations. Um, mm -hmm. rep representative, was that, was that your intent? Well, and actually our schools have been doing that already. I mean, you know, putting a Band-Aid on it, a little scrape, um, but parents are notified. They're notified of that already. And um, giving the child aspirin, they're notified of that. And um, so the intent was not to change that, that the parents were already involved in that, but the intent was that parents are also involved in some of the, the bigger decisions that schools and medical providers um, the medical facilities are taking with our children, the liberties that they're taking with our children right now. Thank you, Representative. Next question is from Don. Uh, will these two bills apply to children att attending charter schools? I can, I can answer that one. These two bills apply to all children. And if we go back to the, um, the previous bill, and I apologize, um, we're jumping around a little bit, but I know that that was specifically addressed in um, Senator Manzella's bill. They actually have a definition. Uh, I apologize, it was in your bill, Representative Seekins Crow. Definition of a child means any individual under 18 years of age. <laughs> so so that, that is addressed in the bill. Um, it is, um, it's not specific to, it, it, frankly, it's not specific to schools even. Um, the bill addresses a variety of, of situations. For example, you can see um, right here in, um, um it's referring to interference interference by a government entity um, but other uh, portions of the bill do not refer specifically to a government entity but the intent the definition um, of child is any individual under 18 years of age um, if you look down under the medical care for children uh, section two it doesn't refer just to state-sponsored institutions, but it refers to um, corporations, associations, organizations, or individuals who are employees of a, of the that sort of broader identification. So, um, 
maybe you could speak to this representative, but it appears that the bill is designed to address pretty broadly the um, the, uh, the the requirements of the protection of the parental choices. Well, absolutely. And right now, I mean, for instance, if a child is going to be given um, medical care, and and I I do think that parents should be notified if um, you know to maybe see patterns, see if there's something going on with a child. If they're ending up at the nurse's station quite frequently. Um, there may be other problems that are going on with the child. And I think parents need to be involved and supportive of that. And, um, you know, if my my child um, is injured or now I have grandchildren, if they're injured and, and there are people who are taking care of them, I'm very thankful for that. That's not to keep them from doing that. But I think that it is important that I know what happened. I mean, right now, um, you know, in custody disputes between parents, one parent must tell the other parent what's going on with the child if they've got a bruise that shouldn't be there. And I think the same thing needs to happen. I mean, maybe the child's being bullied and the school hasn't caught up on it and the parent could catch it if they know that, you know, the child's being hurt at school. Um, and parents need to be that first resource. Parents need to be involved and need to know. And I, I don't know why um, there's um, uh, folks are, you know, scared about that. It, it's and, and if there is abuse in there as well, um, the school still has the uh, responsibility of being the first responder there and the, or the first reporter. And I think that we need to continue to do that. Um, but we don't need to keep parents who do love their children out of their children's well-being, which is what we're start starting to see um, that happening. And we're also, um, I've been told that by teachers firsthand that they've been told um, that they're not to tell parents, that they're not to inform parents. And I'm very concerned about that, that that actually is something that, that teachers are being told. And they're concerned about that too, because they believe as teachers that parents are a part of the solutions. Um, so Representative, I've got uh, one question about um, something we discussed earlier here under uh, section two of the bill. We talked about parents providing uh, prior consent for medical care. Um, and I don't see any um, limitations on um, that prior consent. Was it the intent of the legislature that if a parent provided broad prior consent um, to a school district to, to do whatever, was it, was it was the intent um, to, to recognize that or was the intent to uh, require consent on a case by case yeah. situation by situation basis you're absolutely rob right rob and i appreciate that it's it's to when i say my son uh, um carries an epi pen if he gets stung by a bee please use proper medical care that's what the expectation is and by applying that i mean and, and we tell the school you know my child is diabetic my child is um, allergic to bees or allergic to peanuts. And um, with that prior um, consent as well. So um, I think that that's what's really important there is delineating those two. And I really thank you for bringing that up. Right. So if the, if the consent is, is, for example, broadly given for a situation like uh, an allergy or a particular medical need of the kid or, or even broader than that, if that's given by the parent in advance. That's also part of the bill's recognition of the parent's involvement in in making the choices um, for their minor children. Yep, exactly. Right, like like uh, um, the consent to administer ibuprofen if needed, something like that. Um, I have another question. Uh, there's several questions out here and we're not gonna be able to get to all of them as we come uh, to a close here. Um, I am gonna try to get a couple more in before we go. Um, this one is from Chris in Billings. It says, thanks Senator for your work on this. I, I think he means representative. Um, Cause I think this is directed at your bill, um, Representative Crow. Uh, the emergency exceptions refer to health officials in particular. Would school counselors be prohibited from doing informal mental health questions without parent consent in order to identify if an emergency situation exists or not? Uh, and then an additional question, can a local school board set a policy to allow that scenario? Um, that's a great question. Um... 
I think, um, Rob, what do you think legally there? I mean, I could tell you my opinion, but I don't think that that would fit within the necessarily the bill. Okay, so I'll, I'll take a stab at it. And again, with all the normal caveats that I don't provide legal advice, consult with right. your own attorney. But um, so the, the bill talks about um, making consent to all physical and mental health care decisions for the child. And it appears to me, and especially so after um, hearing your explanation about the purpose of the bill, and also by reading the broad statutory construction uh, provisions of the bill, that that is intended to be broadly interpreted to include um, that sort of uh, mental health care questioning. Um, now, I'm not a judge, and if it ever came before a court, we'd have to see what that meant, what those words meant, but it seems to me the intent of the bill is for that really broad construction about uh, uh, health care decisions. And and I think that it's really important for us to, you know, understand what the law says, what the way the bill is written. And there's always lots of great questions and lots of great what ifs that come up afterwards. I do think that the concern, though, is that um, the parents are made aware of this. Um, and I guess we'll see. I have to see where policy goes with this particular issue um, going further with each school district. One thing that I'll point out, if it's if it's not too obvious, is, um, you know, 40-6-701 is a statute that was um, adopted, I think, in the 2021 session. And then here in the 2023 session with this bill, um, that statute was amended. So certainly there's the opportunity for the legislature to look at existing statutes and adjust them if, um, you know, the decision making, the policy, the interests of the legislature change in the future. Um, certainly that's what you did, Representative, is you looked at an existing statute and um, made, made some changes to it, and that was adopted by the legislature. Um, do you think, uh, Representative, do you think that, that, there's, that there will be an opportunity in the future to maybe look at some of these and um, reconsider or perhaps more specifically define them um, for future sessions? That's what we do. I mean, that's what the legislature does. I mean, most of our bills are existing um, statutes that we're changing or amending. And um, I mean, there's there's quite a few that are new as well, um, but that's how laws are made. And I think it, it's important to have those discussions, but I think it's also important um, to understand why um, these types of bills are important and why they're, 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 they're now there as well and i think that um it's all about the kids and it's about families right now because we know that the family structure is incredibly important for the health and the mental well-being of our children um that's been you know proven over and over again through the generations and so that's what we need to protect is that um we also i'm not going to deny there are children who are are growing up in um very risky situations and we need to protect them as well but not at the risk of, of, of taking away our families and taking away parents' rights. I think that those things can exist together and we just need to work hard at that and make sure that we're, we're finding how to do it better all the time. And as we, as, we, as we draw to the close of our time that we've got allotted for this, I wanna um, thank everybody for attending. We've got just an excellent, turnout tonight. I wanted to thank um, representative and uh, senator who um, made time available in their in their schedules to discuss not only the, the bills, but some of the um, thought and um, motivation behind it um, and give us some of that inside look into what happened up there at the Capitol as these uh, difficult topics were, were being considered and the bill was being uh, drafted. Uh, and I appreciate um, um, Jenna. Uh, I don't know if you have any closing remarks, but um, I appreciate everybody and their their good good questions they had. Yeah, thanks for your time um, on an on an evening where you could be with your families. We appreciate you joining us, um, and we hope you continue to join us. We're doing these every month. Um, this is ongoing. Next month, we're going to be covering House Bill 361. 
an act providing that it is not a discriminatory practice for a student to call a student by a student's legal name or reference a student by a student's sex, um, and House Bill 504, Board of Trustees to adopt a grievance policy. So those will be the two bills we cover. Um, that will be October 25th at the same time, 7 to 8 p.m. Again, we thank you so much. We know there were some questions and comments also that we didn't get to, um, but we appreciate your participation. And if we can be at help at OPI, please feel free to email us, um, as well as your legislators who work um, who work nonstop during the session and out of the session to serve you. So thank you so much, um, Representative, for joining us. And thank My you, pleasure. Rob. And thank you all who attended. Have a great evening.